Okay, welcome. Monday, June 28, class session. This is Matthew 64, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations at Delta College. We are in our last week, and that means we're wrapping everything up and, I don't know, getting to the good stuff, if any of the previous stuff wasn't good enough for you. We are concentrating on the Laplace transform this week, and we're going to concentrate on the Laplace transform handout. And my paper is a little sticky, so I got a piece of cardboard here. It's kind of, there's no airflow in the offices, in at least these offices at Delta College. Um, Laplace transform is like one of the great, great weapons that people invented for differential equations. It is highly specialized on linear problems, but these are exactly the kind of problems you want to use in the real world. So if you're in an engineering context, then you've heard this phrase, or you're going to hear this phrase, or you're going to take this class, it's called control systems. What does it mean to have a control system? So Laplace transform is the mathematical beginning what you need to know to take a control systems class. And even if you would never to take a control systems class, this is just the way you deal with real life articles in differential equations. So the first thing I'm gonna do, take a quick tour of the website, just to make sure you know where you are. And then we're gonna to go to that Laplace transforms handout and tell you exactly where we are there. And then we'll get started doing some problems. We're going to have to lay some theoretical groundwork first. So I think I have everything plugged into the right things and plugged in the right way. And different setup right there. That's okay. Everything's got power. Let's go to our website. That's not our website. Let's try again. Here we go. Okay, so here we are in week six. Very ordinary outline. Outline assessment, handouts, video technology. This week we are only doing four sections. And remember we planned it like that. So when we got to the really, really crucial stuff, we would not be rushing at all. So today we'll talk about how the POS deals with discontinuous functions and second order equations. And that'll cover into your next homework. Your first homework tonight from section 6.2 is specifically about a particular discontinuous function. So that's how Laplace is gonna handle that. Uh, when you look at the problem, you could say that function's not discontinuous, but its derivative is discontinuous. So we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Then we need to know what the Laplace transform does to second order equations, because those are the most important equations to us. And we've talked about the first shifting theorem. And today we're gonna to talk about the second shifting theorem. And I wanna talk about these words that I've highlighted in English. And then we're gonna talk about the next days, delta functions, the, the Dirac function impulse forcing, which again is a very physical and real phenomenon. A bat striking a ball, a lightning bolt, or a voltage surge striking a circuit. And then the most powerful weapon, the one that you really use in the engineering context, convolutions, which is kind of in a way the most mathematically mysterious, but you've done things like this before. And I'll pre that preview preview that with you now. First, before we talk about our Laplace transforms worksheet, let's blow up this two shifting theorems. And we've written the two shifting theorems here. But more important than the mathematical writing is the English description. If you remember the English description, you remember the mathematical formula. But the mathematical formula says, if the Laplace transform of a function is known, that's the, what it says when Laplace transform of little f of t equals capital F of s. Then what happens if you take the Laplace transform of the exponential times the function? You might be worried that you've 
got a whole new mess on your hands? And the beautiful answer is no. You're the same transform you had a second ago. It's just shifted. You replace every S with S minus A. Now we could say that in English like this, when you wrap a function in an exponential envelope, that's the EATF of T. It results in a shifting of its transform. Wrapping a function in an exponential envelope results in shifting its transform. Nothing more dangerous than that. I say exponential envelope here because I want you to think of the e to the a t literally as a like a magnitude of the function f of t. Like when you say three sine t, you say the amplitude of that sine wave is three. But when you say e to the minus two t sine t, then you could say the amplitude or the more common is the envelope of that sine wave is e to the minus two t. That's the phenomenon you saw when you did beats. So if you know the transform of a function and then you multiply that function by e to the at, don't worry, it doesn't damage the transform. Wrapping a function in an exponential envelope results in shifting its transform. And this is why it's called the shifting theorem, the first shifting theorem, we call it. Second shifting theorem, which is where we'll begin today after a second, starts similarly. This if L of F of T equals capital F of S means in English, if you know the Laplace transform of the function little f, then what happens if you, and then whack, looks like you totally mutilated little f right here. Well, you recognize the little f of T minus A is a shifting of some kind but we haven't formally introduced the Heaviside function, which is this unit step function at A. And, but I want you to read this in the same spirit. If you know the transform of a function well, then what happens if you shift T minus A and delay U A of T, the step function at A, what happens if you shift and delay your known function? Do you mutilate the transform? Do you totally make the transform crazy and unrecognizable? The answer is no, it's the same transform. It is the same transform, capital F of S, but now it's wrapped in an exponential envelope. So you could say this backwards. Wrapping a transform in an exponential envelope is the result of a shift in delay in the original function. So I write these two shifting theorems as a good way to remember them as wrapping a function in an exponential envelope. If you wrap the function before you take the transform, then you shift the transform. That's the first shifting theorem. If you wrap the transform in an exponential envelope, then it must have come from a shift and delay of a known function. That is the concept, that is the heart of the first and second shifting theorem. That's where we're gonna to start today. And along the way, we'll learn how to deal with fancier uh, results of partial fraction decomposition. Everybody's got their favorite partial fraction decomposition tricks. I mean, I can show you some. I don't want that to be where we spend all of our time. So we won't get into 6.4 today, but we'll probably do a little 6.2 and 6.3 because we've got to start with this second shifting theorem. Even in 6.2, he's got the first and shifted shifting theorems. Okay, one more statement. Let's go, oh, well, ordinarily, now let's look at your homework just to make sure. Sorry for the extra setup today. Your homework today, uh, it's due tomorrow is from 6.2, a single problem from 6.2, and then a single problem from 6.3, and then last day, problem from 6.4 and 6.5. You know, that first of all, there's four problems instead of five, because we're only covering four sections. Uh, I did push the 6.4 and 6.5 into Thursday. By the end of Tuesday, or, you know, you will be able to do 6.4. You'll need Wednesday to do 6.5, you know, 
legally, but you might be able to look at it still too. Uh, these are homework problems number 31, 32, 33, and 34 in your grade reports. And so we promised about 30 homework problems roughly as it is. We worked out nicely to get one homework problem per section. I would have liked more, but that's the way it worked. And then you know the exam drill. Exam coming up, it'll be released on Thursday night when you hand in your last homework and it'll be due on Tuesday, July 6th. Legally, class ends on July 1. I'm not gonna do any more presentation, but I wasn't gonna cut off the exam on the last day of class. And we added one day here because July 4th occurs on a Sunday, you know, still you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy July 4th. You should just relax. Okay, then you've got your ordinary handouts, Laplace transform facts, that's where we're gonna go. Then you've got your ordinary videos and make sure you're consuming all these videos, particularly the videos that talk about shift and lay, first shifting theorem, heavy side function. Whoops, I didn't mean to click that, sorry. So I've got, you know, examples of the shifting theorems in the videos. Under technology, I've got a very cool Excel spreadsheet, which I don't know why I'm clicking this right now. It shouldn't be more sensitive in my office than at home. So very cool Excel spreadsheet called Convolution, which is gonna make that very, very real to you when we get to Wednesday and Thursday. But then I've still got some Mathematica work. Uh, when we're dealing with the kind of complicated solutions this week, and you're trying to make images, your main tool is gonna to be this Dirac and Heaviside solutions notebook because that will deal with the fancy functions that we're dealing with. But all the notebooks illustrate something. The first four we've already used, and it's these last four that are particularly interesting to us this week. And uh, my pitch for the FAST 13 concept. Okay. That I think does it. Let's switch to the math, uh, to the Laplace transform sheet. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to come back here before we can actually do some work. Let's take a look at this sheet. And what I'm going to do is shrink it. Shrink it, not because I want to make it harder for you to read, because I don't have the paper that I scribbled on in my basement. So I just want to remind you of all the things that we've done on the sheet, which is really the majority, almost all. So let's just circle all the things we've done on this sheet so we know where we are. We have, of course, uh, defined the Laplace transform and used the definition often, although just like the definition of derivative, the limit of the difference quotient, we don't use it if we don't have to. We rather like to build a library of rules. And so that's what we did. Laplace transform of one, Laplace transform of power of t, Laplace transform of an exponential, Laplace transform of a product of exponential and t. Notice the exponential and t power. The Laplace transform of the product is not the product of the individual Laplace transforms. I've had a couple questions on that fact. So, and I'm obscuring things with my boxes here. So. I got to be careful. I don't want to obscure things, but that may be potentially partially unavoidable. Let me try to draw my boxes better. Excuse me. So notice that the Laplace transform of t to the n, e to the a t is not the product of the Laplace transform of t to the n and the product of e to the a t. So you have this sentence down here. The transform of the sum is the sum of the transforms. You have this sentence down here. The transform of a scaling is the scaling of the transform. Those are standard calculus statements because the transform is an integral. The integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. The derivative of a scaling is the scaling of the derivative. But never, ever, ever do you say 
the derivative of the product is the product of the derivatives. You had to invent a whole new rule to differentiate a product. It was the product rule. So product is not a child of linearity. So we need to treat products separately and we will. Now, before we go down to that space, remember we did at the very end sine and cosine last time. You can see derivations of that done a different way on the website. But then by the first shifting theorem, which we completed, the product of an exponential and a cosine is just what? The shifting of the transform of the cosine. Same for sine. The only transforms we've not done in our library are these four at the bottom, and we'll do them, we'll pick them off as we go this week. The T cos and the T sine are not super critical to us right now. So I actually have a handout online showing you how to derive them. We're just not gonna see them very much right now. So don't worry about it per se. But the last two transforms, they're so small and mysterious. Those are very, very important. The U A of T is called the heavy side function at A or in plain English, the step function at A. And the delta A of T is called the Dirac function at A or the impulse function at A. Okay, what else do we got going on this piece of paper? I'm trying to highlight everything we've done. We have done these two rules, excuse me. We have done these two rules for Laplace transform of derivative and Laplace transform of multiple derivatives. Let me draw that a little bit nicer. But I made this sheet so small, so I can't help that I've drawn my boxes over that. We legally have talked about the Laplace transform, the first shifting theorem. And today we'll talk about the second shifting theorem. So this is where we are on this sheet. We've almost got a library completed. We've almost got all the powerful properties completed. Second thing we're going to do today is the second shifting theorem. First thing is the heavy side function. And then the most powerful trick at all is called the convolution. And look at the bottom. The Laplace transform of x times y is the transform of x times the transform of y. No, that's not what it says. If the Laplace transform of a product was a product of the Laplace transforms, then some of my blue boxes would be wrong upstairs. No, this asterisk right here is not multiplication. It's legally, it's called convolution. It's kind of, you could call it in a way, although I'm hesitant to do this, a product rule for transforms. But it's more like what you did in calculus three. Remember, you know how to multiply numbers, but the question came up, can you multiply vectors? You multiply vectors, how? Well, you added vectors just by adding their slots. Why don't we multiply vectors just by multiplying their slots? No. Actually, no one's ever done that. Maybe you can make a go of it, but that's not how we do it. Uh, we invented two kind of odd multiplications for vectors. They were called the dot product and the cross product. And neither one of them felt like a multiplication truly in the sense of three times two is six. But we actually didn't mind because the dot product and the cross product did such beautiful new things that we forgave them, that they didn't look like the products we learned in the fourth grade, third grade, second grade, whatever. So in calculus three, you invented products of vectors. They were called the cross product and the dot product. And at first when you invented them, they looked kind of arbitrary and crazy, but then you learned about the coolest things you, they did and then you accepted them as friends. And it'll be the same way now with this new multiplication called convolution. At first it looks really crazy and weird, almost 
unhuman or inexecutable, but it has such a beautiful result that it's quickly going to become one of our best friends. Okay, so now you see where we are in this sheet. And when I leave this sheet, all these blue boxes disappear. So I am not going to recolor this sheet if I come back to it today. Maybe you have your own sheet that you're crossing off on your desk. <coughs> okay, now we get down to business. So I'm going to stop the share. Back to the paper. Uh, good. Uh, someone is asking this question. I don't mind, but I'll share it with everyone. When are the grades posted and due? I, that is a good question. I'll have to ask someone above me. As far as grading goes, you're pretty certain that I'm going to grade this very quickly. I will. I will get the grades turned into the college ASAP as quickly as possible. And when I email you your final grade report, it'll be after the grades are turned in. So I don't know exactly what the hour is, but your grades will be in the college registrar on the 6th or the 7th, I'm pretty certain. Uh, I mentioned that because some of you need or want to transfer them, okay. But when you get that email from me that your grades are posted, then they are posted in the college system. And then you can begin to politely ask the registrar to get your transcript or whatever you have to do. But yes, yeah, so everybody's delayed. Everybody's short staffed right now. Okay, so yeah, we'll answer that grades do stuff later. But it's a good question. Okay, now let's go to the meat of the day, which is the great and powerful heavy side function. And for such a, and with a name, with a name like the heavy side function, it sounds threatening, right? Heavy side is in honor of the English physicist Oliver Heavy Side. But it's got a very simple description. And it's got a very simple drawing, which I'm going to give you right now. I do have my colored pens with me. And so we'll see how they come out. Let A be a real number on the T axis. Uh, I'm not implying any scale whatsoever. This is the heavy side function. It is zero until you reach A, and then it is one after you reach A. It's called the heavy side function. Everybody's got a different name. Mathematica calls it the heavy side theta function. I'll tell you why in a second, but we're going to use the notation of the author just so it makes it easier for you to read the author's presentation. U A of T is defined to be zero. If T is less than A, and one if T is greater than or equal to A. Uh, keep the equal sign on the A, on the one. You could argue or debate whether it makes a difference. Legally, it should be on the one. That's it. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's called the unit step function. At t equals a. Now it's called that because at t equals a, you take one step up. Very simple. And you don't do anything else. You just exist at one for the rest of eternity. Uh, now the problem is when you see this function, you see it displayed many ways. Some people, instead of u sub zero, just say u. And then, now that would be the unit step function at zero. And then when they want to say the unit step function at A, what do they do to it? They just shift it 
a units to the right. You're familiar with the idea that shifting an argument moves a function left or right. So some people use u for unit step function. We're going to use u sub 0 or u sub a. We're going to show you where step is. Now, besides you, then you're going to get into a horrid, horrid collection of historical letters. Uh, some people say H for heavy sign. Some people say theta, and that's why they call it the heavy side theta function. Some, you know, some people believe a function isn't really important until you've named it with a Greek letter. But uh, you know, so if you see in your engineering textbook theta of t minus a, then you know that they mean the unit step function t minus a. Probably, always consult your book to see what notation they're using. Uh, what other notations do people use? Get a little bit different camera setup, so I'm gonna be careful with my paper today. Uh, Mathematica. writes Mathematica, not to be outdone, says the more letters I use means the function is more important. So Mathematica says heavy side theta, capitalize H, capitalize T at T minus A. That is what we call UA of T. So get used to people using different notations. You already know that in mathematics classes, you can't avoid it. We're gonna consistently use the use of A notation, but just be ready for people that do different things. Okay, so now that you've met the function and you know what it's called, it's very, very underwhelming. So like, wow, that's all there is to it. Well, it turns out to be a massively powerful function, a, a great helper function, and an awesome way to define piecewise functions. So let me give you an example. When I say u of 3 of t, and you know what that looks like. I move over to three seconds, and then I go from zero to one. In my drawings today, I'm not implying any scale, just whatever scale is appropriate. So I call that three and I call that one, but you know those scales are not the same on the two axes. Think about the heavy side function like this, and this is a really important way to say it. What I'm doing is turning on a switch, a light switch, a power switch, uh, opening a valve in a uh, water supply. I am turning something on at t equals three. Let me show you how this works in practice. Let's say I'm going to take the Laplace transform at three. I'm sorry, not Laplace transform. No Laplace transforms yet for the first hour, probably. Let's say I take the heavy side function at three, which I just drew. And then let's take another beautiful function that you love called the sine function. And sine function, I'm not going to draw this perfectly. Ta-da! Sine function starts middle, ends middle, 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 middle high, middle low. But that endpoint right there was at 2 pi. And that middle point was at pi. Now let's take the heavy side function at 3 and ask 
what happens when you multiply these two? So this is a, just a very ordinary sine wave. This is the heavy side function. The horizontal axis in all my drawings right now is the t-axis. What happens when you multiply these two? And the problem is I can't use an asterisk for multiplication because I just called it convolution. An x for multiplication looks like the variable x. So I'm going to use a dot for multiply. Just a notational thing. And you sometimes see that, right? You know, 2 dot 3 is 6. Because right now we're not doing vector dotting. So I won't confuse you with that. Let's multiply these two. And tell me what you get. Well, very simply, you get nothing until three seconds, right? And let's illustrate this one in blue. Because for the first three seconds, you could say time backwards too, but let's just concentrate on the first three seconds. This is worth a zero. Remember this, the heavy side function is never anything more than a zero or a one. So for the first three seconds, this is worth a zero. What's zero times sine? Zero. But then at three seconds, it's worth a one. And what's one times sine? Sine. Now notice that at three seconds, sine is slightly above the axis right here. So actually what happens is I go down, I go through two pi, I sorry, I go through pi and I complete my cycle at two pi. And then I keep executing sine cycles. Why? Because sine goes on forever. About the heavy side function, one goes on forever. So I literally, when I multiply these two functions, I turned on the sine function turned on sine t at t equals three. Now that looks like a very small observation, but be patient with it because we can take it to a lot of awesome, cool places. What would have rather happened? Let's try a new one. Let me graph you u pi. Let's get busy here of t times the sine of t minus pi. because I want to play a little word game with you. You could look at the blue function that I drew above and say, you didn't turn on the sine function at three. You just started drawing it at three. Okay, so what do I mean by turned on? Well, let's investigate this function, u pi of t times sine of t. Let's make it green. Let's put pi right here. So this says, until you get to pi, you are nothing, or well, the function is nothing. Because I don't care what is attached to the heavy side function. If the heavy side function is zero, it doesn't matter what you got here. It's zero. The product is zero. But at pi seconds, then the heavy side function fades into the background. It becomes a one, and a one times anything is just this thing. So the heavy side function at pi seconds becomes a one. And now I start graphing sine of t minus pi. Now, sine of t minus pi is different than sine t. Sine of t minus pi is the sine function shifted pi units to the right. So this time, I have flipped the switch. and start drawing sine waves. In both cases, I flipped a switch, but here in the blue curve, it's like you flipped a switch and you turned on sine kind of in mid wave. And maybe that's not what you want. Maybe what you want is when you turn on the sine function, you want it to start oscillating at its natural beginning. Well, that's what I did right here. I turned it on at pi, and then I started the sine wave at pi. 
And this is what we refer to as a shift and delay. The delay is the translation of sine, pi units to the right. Sorry, I got it backwards. The delay is the not turning it on for pi seconds, my fault. The shift, that's the shifting of the sine function, two, three units to the, pi units to the right. So this is called a shift and delay. And then automatically, if you're prepping for the second shifting theorem, you say, oh, that's what shift and delay means. Shift and delay means delay the start and shift the execution. Let's try it again. These pens are like seriously bleeding through my paper. Let's try it again. What if I said to you, pay very close attention, u1 of t, t squared, versus u1 of t, t minus one squared. This is the critical, critical difference. Tells you what shifting and delaying means. I know what t squared looks like, but in this first case, it doesn't matter. For the first one second, there is no t squared. For the first one second, t squared is zero times t squared, give me a zero. But then at one second, then this function turns on. Now it's one times t squared. But t squared at one second is at one. And at two seconds, it's at four. And at three seconds, it's at nine. So u sub one times t squared is just turning on t squared without shifting it. You would say that's not a full version of t squared. Well, neither is this one that I'm about to draw, but it looks a little more useful. I'm gonna use blue ink this time. And I'm just having issues maneuvering my camera, so be patient with me. Again, until one second, I am just at zero. That's what the heavy side function says. But then at one second, I turn on this parabola which is the natural parabola shifted one unit to the right. Now these two pictures are not the same. And you say, I didn't expect them to be the same. They have different descriptions. But look at the difference in the physical picture. Here, I have discontinuous function. Here I shifted it so it began continuously. Okay, that's the first power of the heavy side function. Now let's talk about the second power of the heavy side function. This bleeding pen business is gonna annoy me. Now let's say here's u sub one of t, here's u sub two of t, what happens if I take u sub one of t minus u sub two of t? Some of you may have seen a presentation like this before and I don't mind at all, just you're just hearing how I present it. So I try to draw a little bit lighter so I don't get this bleed through. u sub one of t means turn on the heavy side function at one, take a step, at one. U sub two of t means turn on at two. It means take a step at two. When, when it comes down to real drawing, when I'm in a hurry, I'm not gonna make these open circles, closed circles. I'm just gonna depend, depend on you knowing that the open circle is on the left side and the closed circle is on the right side. 
And then when it gets really down to it, it's not going to bother us whether it was open or closed there. So for right now, I'm taking pains to try to draw open circles, closed circles. They don't appear that large on your camera. But the really, really important thing is what happens when you combine these two heavy side functions in this manner. Let's talk it out. U sub one turns on the light switch at one. U sub two turns on the light switch at two. So what happens when you subtract them? Well, first of all, until you get to one, absolutely no one cares. Because until you get to one, these are both turned off and you'll be doing zero minus zero, which is a big old zero. But now you get to step at one. At t equals one, this person turns on, but this person is not turned on yet. So now you'll be doing one minus zero. For how long? Until you get to two, when this person turns on, where u sub two of t turns on, and then you'll have one minus one, which is back to zero. Again, legally, close dot on the right side, open dot on the left side, but don't worry about it. Most often I'll just draw lines with no dots on them. Now let's describe this behavior. This is turn on at t equals one. This is turn on at t equals two. But this English description is really gonna help me. This is, you could probably guess what I'm gonna write. Turn on at t equals one, turn off at t equals two. A heavy side function is like an on off switch. Plus turn on, minus turn off. You know, wipe on, wipe off. So some of the TV networks are replaying Karate Kid recently. And if you talk about movies that don't age well, even though it's a fun movie, the Karate Kid is like in the category of rush hour. The things that were said in rush hour the networks even put disclaimers at the beginning before they screen rush hour, saying, well, the, the language and the interactions depicted in this movie uh, reflect a previous whatever. Not good or not bad. No, I'm not gonna talk like they talk in rush hour. I'm not gonna talk like they talk in the Karate Kid, but the Karate Kid kind of also suffers from that a little bit. It's like a little bit out of time. Still a good movie. So the famous line from the Karate Kid is when Pat Morita is teaching Ralph, and I don't know how to pronounce the name, I apologize, but Macheo or some, excuse me, I'm not pronouncing the name well. You know, it's wipe on, wipe off. You know, wipe on, wipe off. And that's teaching in the essence of this karate move. Well, the heavy side function, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, plus turn on, minus turn off. And now look what that allows us to do. We are doing actually very well right now, time-wise, because the most important thing you can do is have a clear understanding of the value of the Heaviside function. And then we'll be able to do exceptional things. Let's say at two seconds, I want two periods of sine wave to float in midair and that means up down up I'm not drawing this beautifully up down up and i want absolutely nothing else to happen so my graph is going to be and now i cannot do it cuz i already drew it in black right I'm gonna be zero until two seconds. Then I'm gonna go two revolutions of sine or two periods of sine. And then I'm gonna be zero afterwards. 
Well, I'm going to do this in a couple ways. And let's say I want that sine wave to float uh, six units in the air. Well, first I have to figure out what sine wave floats six units in the air with a period of one. And I think that would be this. Sine of two pi t, that's sine wave of period one second. And then start at six in height. That's start at six in height, but it's not start at two in horizontal. So I have to do sine of two pi times t minus two. That starts the sine wave of two seconds and then add six. And even that is not correct because that would be the whole sine wave over and over and over again across from left to right. What I want to do is turn it on at two seconds and turn it off at four seconds. That's way too crowded, I apologize, but I wrote u sub two of t minus u sub four of t. This is, and read all the cues, the sine wave, it's six units raised, with a period of one, shifted two units to the right, and only turned on at two seconds before it is turned off at four seconds. Let me write that full-sized because that's really, really important. Because now you have an idea. I could describe any piecewise function in the universe by using the heavy side function to describe when each piece turns off and when each piece turns on. Let me move my paper up. That's this function right here. It's actually the whole function from negative infinity to positive infinity. This is on. This is off, on at two, off at four. There's a sine wave raised, shifted, and scrunched. Now, if I drew for you, and we'll shortly take a break, any piecewise function, let's say I want a line, and then I want to wiggle one sine wave, and then I want to hop down here and start a square root symbol before I ride off into the sunset with the right-hand side of a parabola. Zero, two, four, six, eight. Now, right now, right now I think I'm like, shoot, what did I get myself into? Is someone gonna make me draw these four pieces? Well, I just drew them. Is someone gonna make me write the formula for the four pieces? Oh, what the heck. Turn on at zero, turn off at two. Turn what on and off? This line of intercept one and slope one. And then turn on at two and turn off at four. Turn what on at two and what off at four? A sine wave that's been raised three units. It has a period of two. So it is sine of pi times something times what? Uh, it is shifted two units to the right so legally that's t minus two. That's that second piece. Now the third piece is turned on at four, turned off at eight. And by the way, never are we gonna use this in a differential equation 
multiple pieces like this, not four pieces. I mean, on the other hand, we could do things with multiple pieces, but these pieces are a little bit too random for our taste. And what is this? This is a square root of x, I'm sorry, t, I'm using a t axis, minus four, one unit raised. That's that piece. And then the last piece starts at eight. And now I got an interesting idea. What if I never wanted to turn it off? Well, then don't ever turn it off. And let's take this to be t minus eight quantity squared. Now you did look at a lot of pictures like this in your calculus class, maybe, maybe not this exotic, maybe just like straight lines that got kinks in them. You called these piecewise functions. And you did draw them previously with a very simple tool. You just said f of t is, and then you made a list, t plus one. And I'm not gonna squeeze this in. Three sine pi, t minus two. And then one plus square root of t minus four. And then t minus eight squared. And then you said, if, 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 if. And I don't have room to write these. But you see what I've done is given you one function written, one formula written that takes the place of this crazy piecewise defined notation you used to use. Maybe you prefer the purple one. But actually for the Laplace transform, we're gonna prefer this one because the Laplace transform knows how to eat up and spit out heavy side functions. And it's on your sheet. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. I'm in a hurry. So I'm not writing things nicely. Sine wave raised three units. Okay, good. So right now, what do you think about the heavy side function? Oh, it's very cool. You know, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. And you're thinking it's a little exotic, like, okay, why do I need to know that? But once I show you what the Laplace transform does to it, then that opens a massive door for us. Like the Laplace transform didn't mean anything to you until I showed you what it did to a derivative. Well, now I think we're gonna take a break and then I'll show you what the Laplace transform does to the heavy side function. And then you're gonna say, Oh, now I can do differential equations with crazy discontinuous forcings. Maybe this one doesn't impress you, but haven't I shown you a problem already where I had like a square wave? You know, voltage on, voltage off, voltage on, voltage off. That could be described now with some simple heavy side functions. But now, if I tell you what the Laplace transform does to these, the square wave, now I can use square waves in my differential equations. Okay, I promised a break. So let's take a look at the clock. Let's call it 1258. You've been very patient for this little theoretical discussion. So let's come back at 104. Maybe I could invent a new back at simple, back at 104. Let's try it. Okay, and you guys have, uh, you know, you catch the recording. I know some of you have other appointments right now, but you know, you can come back to this recording at this point if you like. I'm gonna mute my microphone and take a break. Stretch my legs, you can do the same. I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, and we're back. So what I'm going to do for you right now is show you your first differential equation with the heavy side function. And I need to show you two things in order to execute differential equation with the heavy side function. Let's get my paper torn off. Part of the bleed through on the paper is when I'm drawing functions, and drawing and redrawing them. So two key facts. What does the Laplace transform do to a generic heavy side function? And then the second shifting theorem. What does the Laplace transform do when a heavy side function turns on a function? And we'll add turns on and delays. Right. Even without the minus a there, I could still deal with that, but patience, one step at a time. Well, the first answer is, if you take the Laplace transform of a heavy side function at a, you get e to the minus a s times one over s. You could write this together as e to the minus a s over s. But in the practical use of them, often you're considering the exponential and the function inside it separately. So I'll just emphasize that function inside it like a transform, like a transform of one, by the way, and the exponential on the outside. What does this say, the second shifting theorem? Second shifting theorem, remember we practiced reciting it today before we even knew what it meant. When you shift and delay a function, you don't do anything to its transform at all, except wrap it in an exponential. Notice the a and the minus a here. Same as the a and the minus a here. Be careful when you're dealing with the heavy side function Laplace transforms that you account for the signs correctly. Notice how you change that sign. And this is f, the Laplace transform of f originally was capital F of s. Now, before I prove these, they must be proven. And they're not hard to prove. But before I prove these, let's your, whet your appetite and show you how I can use this to solve a differential equation, show you some cool graphics. So let's take a very simple differential equation. Let's say dy dt equals minus two y, you know that differential equation by heart, the most valuable problem in all of differential equations. But now let's add a forcing function. A very simple, let's get as simple as we can. At three seconds, I will turn on the light switch. Now you know that this is literally two differential equations. I guess you can call it two differential equations in succession. It's minus two y plus zero until t equals three. But then at t equals three and after, it becomes dy dt equals minus 2y plus 1. Now, both of these you could solve back in chapter 1. 
But the beauty of Laplace transform is Laplace transform solves them both at the same time. Because remember, the technique would have been here. Take the initial conditions, solve this problem, plug in the initial conditions. At three seconds, find out what you, where you are. And that becomes new initial conditions for the second problem. You know, not difficult. But it takes some effort. Now let's do one more thing right here. Let's give some initial conditions to this problem. I'm not sure what initial conditions I want to give it. I've used a two and a three. I hesitate to use a four, but what the heck. I always don't like things to be too far out of my reach. So let's use what we know about the plus transform and heavy side function, because I got the transform and the heavy side function right here to solve this differential equation. And I'm gonna try to tone down the color coding today because of the different environment, but I write it with the primes instead of the dy dt. I like that compact notation myself. I apply the Laplace transform to both sides. Whatever you do onto one side, you do onto the other. The golden rule of mathematics. Do onto the left side as you did onto the right. And you know what the Laplace transform does to derivative. S times Laplace transform of the original, subtract y at zero. Let me write that down just so you practice seeing it. And y at zero is four. On this side, it's minus two times Laplace transform of the original. And now I got to take the Laplace transform of u sub three of t. So I'm going kind of slow right here. Well, let's take this negative four, toss it on the other side. Let's take this minus two LY, toss it on this side and factor it out. So let's be efficient right now. So I have S plus two times LY. And over here, this is an E to the minus three S, one over S. Now we divide by S plus two and we are done. But you know that joke. I can pretend we're done because I've discovered the Laplace transform of y. But remember, this is in a foreign language. I need to translate translate it back to my language. This is in I used the uh, I used the um, example of French and German on a previous day because you know I know enough German not to die if you parachute me into Germany. I know enough French to say hello and goodbye probably and croissant and things like that. And I'm not making fun. I respect French language and French culture a great deal. Uh, I'm just saying I even took French in college. I don't remember very much. But let's not talk about French German. Let's be more direct. This is an algebra sentence, and I want a differential equation sentence. So I got to translate back to differential equations. Now I recognize this four times one over s plus two. I know exactly what that is. That's actually four e to the minus two t, which looks very good, by the way. Wouldn't the solution to this problem be? four e to the minus two t with that initial condition? Absolutely, that would be the beginning. But now I got to read this. Let's emphasize the e to the minus three s. And here I'll do a quick partial fraction decomposition. And I'll illustrate, although I don't want to illustrate too much partial fraction decomposition because I know you can do it, you can do it yourself, but what's called the cover up method if you want to know the coefficient above the s, then you cover up the s and put in s equals zero, so you get one half. If you want to know the coefficient of the s plus two, then you cover up the s plus two and put in minus two because s plus two is zero at minus two and you get minus one half. That's called the cover up method. Works very quickly when you have single factors here, no repeated factors. And then there's an advanced cover-up method and other methods, and you know maybe we'll illustrate them as we can. 
Now let's look at this right here. This looks like one half one over s minus one half one over s plus two. And that comes from a one. One over s comes from one. One over s plus two comes from e to the minus two t. But notice that this transform is wrapped in an exponential. So second shifting theorem. If the transform is wrapped in an exponential, then you recognize the function it came from. But in order to say where this wrapped transform comes from, you have to shift and delay the function you know. So right now I have one plus e to the two minus t inside here. And now wrapped in an exponential function. So now I shift and delay. This is your first application of the second shifting theorem. So I have four e to the minus two t, but now I'm going to shift and delay one half minus one half e to the minus two t. And what is that gonna be? The delay is gonna be three seconds. And the shift, if you shift e to the minus two t by three seconds, you get this. If you shift one by three seconds, it's still one. Here's my answer. Sorry, I didn't slide that up. So I recognize the two pieces inside the exponential envelope as one and e to the minus two t Coefficients one half and minus one half come from the partial fraction decomposition. But by the second shifting theorem, if I recognize a transform and it's wrapped in an exponential, what I have to do is take the function that it came from and shift and delay the beginning of that function. Shift and delay, there's no other way. Now, first reaction is, okay, that's cool that I got a formula. What does it look like? And I can only draw this very crudely, right? But let's try to draw it. And then we'll, sorry, different camera set up, shaking the camera here. Let's try to draw it casually, crudely, qualitatively. And then let's go to Mathematic and draw it. So 4e to the minus 2t I know starts at 4 and decays kind of quickly. And that's all that's going to happen for three seconds. Do you see that until you get to three seconds, this is a big old zero right here. But once you get to three seconds, then this function turns on. And what function is it? It's one half and then subtract one half dying exponential. In fact, if I wrote it together, it'd be one half one minus dying exponential. We've seen something like this in mixture theorems before. As this exponential dies, it becomes zero. This is just one half times one. One half times one is down here. So this function is going to slide up to one half. Now you see I made a poor quantitative picture, four and one half. No, no, one half is not four times, four times one half is not four. But what I want to do is illustrate this decay, hitch, rise. And why is it doing that? because for the first three seconds, it was imitating the driving function and the driving function was zero. But then at three seconds, 
the driving function became what? One. And again, I'm not gonna draw this to scale, but the driving function stepped up to one. And when the driving function stepped up to one, my differential equation responded by trying to imitate it. Now that's a good qualitative drawing, but let's open up mathematical. Let's open up the notebook that I advertised to you and let's see it executed. That is called the Dirac and uh, Heaviside functions. And let me open it up. And then let me adjust it in front of you. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to open it up here, then we'll straighten this out. I just got, I was using it to do some other things. So I've got some other things littered in here. Okay, let's just try it. Uh, mine doesn't look exactly like yours because I was working and adjusting things on this but you can adjust it yourself. So what do solutions look like from Dirac and heavy side forcing? Now we haven't done Dirac yet. Let's just, we're talking about heavy side forcing. So let's solve a differential equation. It's not two second order, it's first order. It's what? Y prime equals, or I could have said plus two Y, but minus two Y's plus, now I gotta say heavy side function theta and Mathematica prompts me, thankfully, at t minus three, which is starting at three seconds. I don't need two initial conditions, I only need one. And my initial condition was four. So this is our differential equation. Uh, I'm telling Mathematica to numerically solve it. Actually, I could probably solve it directly too. Let's take off the numerical. Let's just do desolve. Here, let's type in the answer I wrote. 4x of minus 2t stop plus, now it's going to get ugly, plus heavy side function at theta at t minus 3 stop times this 1 half minus 1 half business. 1 half minus 1 half exponential open minus two shifted t minus three, got it, close, go. Because what I want to do is compare mathematical solution to mine. It's angry about my parentheses. It says I'm missing a parentheses. Okay, now it's happier. So let's do this and then plot just my solution here. Well, let's just go and see what, I'm not sure because I've been monkeying with this sheet. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. Let's see what happens. There we go. Check that out. That function was decaying from four. I think I want to show the four, don't I? So let's go up to five. Let's cut that at minus one. Uh, this was a minus one to eight, eight, stuff like that. Good, got it. Try again. Okay, it, it flattens my function a little bit, but check that out. Here on the right, I drew the formula y of t that I constructed. Here on the left, in blue dotted, is the solution from Mathematica's desolve command. I didn't show you what the desolve output was. Notice the desolve output is right here. Now again, it's written funny. You could decode it and show that it's the same as we did, but Mathematica writes it the way it pleases. So I'm not going to focus on that right now. But what if I put Mathematica's solution in light gray and my solution y of t in blue dots. Just to further emphasize solution. So now my solution is blue dots. Blue dotted is the y of t. And the evaluation of Mathematica's solution is the light gray. 
you can barely see that light gray, but I wanted you to also see the blue dots. I got I'm not, my monitors are rearranged, so I got to make sure I'm, you're seeing what I'm seeing. I think you're seeing this. And I'm pretty sure we're recording it. <laughs> and we probably said move the paper up eight minutes ago. Sorry, Drew, but yeah, get the paper up there. So very cool. My differential equation responded to the driver. In fact, let me draw the driver. What was the driving function? Heavy side at three. So let me add to this picture the heavy side function at three, and let's make that one red. The heavy side function at three takes a step of one unit at three. And my solution, why is it decaying? Because it's racing down to meet this zero driving function. It's funny to say zero driving function. It's like saying no driving function at all, but why don't you call it a zero driving function? And then at three seconds, it becomes a one driving function. And my solution doesn't become one, but it does what? Lags and imitates the driving function slowly climbs up to a constant function. This time it's the constant function one half. So it's imitating the constant function and slowly catching up to it, lagging behind. There's your first differential equation with heavy side function. But now I'm gonna really blow your mind. What if we change that driving function to be heavy side function at one. I'm going to get rid of my solution here because I don't, well, let's just say I'm not going to use it. I'll just use the machine solution and I'll say f of t for my driving function. And I'll define instead of y of t, I'll define f of t is my heavy side function at one. Let's run this. Uh, let's turn off that plot. I don't need it. Let's close that plot. Let's say heavy side function at one. So let's rerun this. There, I only get one picture. I'm getting the thing in blue. Let's cut out that blue dotted. Let's just make it red. There's the driver in red and the solution in right gray. Let's change the solution to blue. There. So I decay one set to one second and then I flatten out. Now let's take away the heavy side function at two. Let's turn off the switch. And let's change this to just a raw f of t to save myself some typing. Now look what happens. Decay, flatten, decay. Now let's turn on the switch at three. Now the problem is I'm gonna, this is gonna get very frustrating if I just have to keep copying and pasting. So I think I'll use a different device in a second. Well, let's turn on the driving function at three. So off, on, off, on. Now let's turn off the driving function at four. What am I doing? I'm talking about a square wave now. You know, starting this thing at four, why don't we start it at uh, minus one? Oh, climbs to zero, climbs to one, climbs to zero, climbs to one. What I'm doing, I showed you this in a problem earlier in the course where you had to sketch, or maybe I just had a recommended problem where you sketched a function solving a square wave. Now, if I was just to keep this going and let me keep it going, but 
I guess I don't want to get too fancy right now. So I'm going to turn it on at five. I'm going to turn it off at six. Turn it on at seven and turn it off at eight. Uh, this is so much typing. It's got to be a better way. There is, but right now I don't want to illustrate it. Look at that. For you electrical people in the audience, what I'm doing is discharging a capacitor, but then I'm doing an alternating voltage across the capacitor. So when the voltage is off, the capacitor is discharging. Let's just send that from zero on. And when the, when the voltage is on at one, the capacitor is charging. Off, on, off, on. Capacitor is charging and decaying with time. Let me change that to uh, one minus this whole mess up there. So I switch the ons and the offs. There, decay, decay, rise, 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 rise. Let me change that initial condition. Look at this pattern that it settles into, right? Let me change this initial condition to minus one. Not one, minus one. Do you see that nothing changes in the eventual solution? Why? Because this eventual solution is the YP. And the YH is just the exponential decay at the very beginning. So what I have, no matter where I start this, it started at five, is the solution settles into this on-off pattern, it's kind of shark fin pattern, no matter where I start the problem. And that's because my solution is imitating. Let's start the problem at zero. This will be interesting. Well, okay, I thought it was gonna be interesting. Let's start the problem at zero. Ah, let's start the problem at one. That would be interesting. No, I thought it was going to be interesting, but it's not interesting. <laughs> okay, let's let's not try to make magic where it's not happening. But I see this capacitor charging and discharging or charging and decaying. And I see why is it why is it not changing after time? Because the yh is just the four e to the minus t or the e to the minus two t portion that goes away as time goes away and my solution settles into a YP. Now you could actually do a D solve on this if you like, and you know, I'll let you do that. If you want to, I don't wanna do a D solve on this F right here, because although it did it pretty simply, didn't it? Uh, it's, it's Mathematica is gonna write things in a funny way. Okay, now we're gonna go to the next level. So notice that was a first order differential equation. I want to move up to second order differential equation. And I want to move up to what we call constant juggling. So let me close this Mathematica notebook and see if I can bring up one more set of examples to focus on today. As normal. We will scan and post these after the session is over. Let's look at Mathematica working on a second order equation. I got to decide what second order equation I want and what I want it to look like. Maybe let me see if there's a good example in the book. Because the problem is this uh, shift and delay stuff requires practice. So I'm looking in section 6.2. You should even practice writing and decoding Laplace transforms. Yes, why don't we start there? 
let's practice writing and decoding the Laplace transform. He makes that a particular point in section 6.2 and section 6.3. Let me look for a good example from each. Yes, that's beautiful. So let's first, Just two more shift and delay practices. So he pairs these questions. Let's look at uh, Problem number seven in section 6.2. And a similar problem, not the same. Let me see if I can find one closer. Nah, let's just roll with it. Let's look at 6.3, number 18. Because now you know how to do just about any discontinuous driving function. Laplace transform the first and second shifting theorems. But you need to practice coding and decoding your transforms. So first he does this example here, 14 e to the minus s over three s plus two s minus four. So what is this? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? This is decoding a transform. Well, in order to show you where it came from, and you know, it's kind of, you could argue about where to put the 14 if you want to. Let's put the 14 on the inside. You could have it on the inside or the outside of the exponential. But to decode this, you have to do two things. You're gonna certainly have to do a partial fraction decomposition to break this into two fractions. But you're also gonna to have to account for the exponential wrapper on the transform. So first let's do the partial fraction decomposition. And I'm gonna do that very quickly. Two linear factors. You can check this if you like, but I also already showed you what I call the cover up method. When you have two linear factors not repeated, you can cover up S minus four and put four in here to find the number on top here. So that's 14 over 12 plus two is 14. 14 over 14 is one. Then you could cover up to three S plus two to find the number on top of there by plugging in s equals minus two thirds. That's a little messier. Oh, negative two thirds, subtract 12 thirds is what? Negative 14 thirds. So what's 14 divided by minus 14 thirds? I think it's minus three. He was trying to be friendly to you, making you do a partial fraction decomposition without fractions too much. I didn't move the paper, I'm sorry. E to the minus s. Now, patience, I'm gonna write this one more time before I'm ready to go. Well, in fact, the one over s minus four is definitely ready to go. That's e to the four t. But this got the three in an awkward place why don't I factor out and cancel a three top and bottom? And what I really have here is minus one times one over S plus two thirds. I wanna write it in the one over S minus A form because now I know that this one comes from E to the 14 
And I know that this one comes from minus E. What's your A? Not two thirds, minus two thirds T. Now that is if there was no exponential wrapper. That's where these two would have come from if there was no exponential. But now I got the exponential wrapper here. I'm thinking of the tag team commercial for progressive insurance, you know, scoop, there it is. Scoop, there it is. I've got my daughter convinced that I think that that's tag team's original song. Don't tell her. So I say, yeah, I know rap. So and then I pull up the progressive insurance commercial. Scoop, there it is. Boom, shot the bar. Now, and then Wendy's did the commercial, right? You know, they drew a bag. So I've got my daughter convinced that I know rap, or well, she just rolls her eyes. I think that's her sign for being convinced. Okay, what do I need to do? I need to shift and delay. So the shifting is what is the A right here? The A is one minus A S. A is one. So I'm going to shift a delay by A equals one second. Here's the shift. All I did was shift these two functions. Got it. Now here's the delay. I don't want them to kick in until I get to one second. It's not hard to do this. You just got to practice doing it and saying it. So there's an example of the second shifting theorem because I had a transform wrapped in an exponential. Over here, let's do another practice in 6.3 before we head to a differential equation. Uh, number 18 says s plus 1 over s plus 6, s squared plus 6s plus 10. Now what's different about this? You know what? We're going to call it 18 prime because I want to enlighten you even more. So let's wrap this in an exponential wrapper. Now we're going to do serious work. Let's hold off on the exponential wrapper until I figure out what this is. Unlike the previous problem, I cannot factor the denominator. And in algebra land, that's a signal, isn't it? That's a signal that you had complete the square, that you actually had a perfect square plus a perfect square. And if you haven't completed the square for a long time, okay, you're gonna have to wake that up. But if I completed the square on the bottom, I get s plus three quantity squared plus one is s squared plus three s plus three s is plus six s plus nine plus one is plus 10. If you like later, perhaps I'll show you how to complete the square quickly, but Right now, I'm just going to execute this problem for you. Now, what are you thinking? In your mind, you're thinking s squared plus 1. You're thinking sine, cosine. Well, which one had the s on top? It was cosine. This is a cosine. What's your omega? This is omega squared. Omega squared is 1. So omega is 1. That's not too bad. But well, what's this s plus 3? It's a shifting of the s. What? When do you shift s? When do you shift s? You shift s when you did what? When you wrapped your function in an exponential before you did the transform. Now, be con don't. I've got a wrapping afterwards too. So this function, this problem, I've got wrapping before and wrapping after. But first, let's deal with the wrapping before. 
And the problem is this s plus three means a is minus three. So I got an e to the minus three t attached to this, but I've got to have equal shifting. I need s plus three to appear on the top. Remember, because the cosine form is s over s squared plus omega squared. I can't have one version of s in the bottom, one version of s in the top. I need the s versions to match. So what I'm going to do is write s plus three over s plus three squared plus one. But you very rightly say, you can't do that because you've changed the problem. Well, as being the sneaky person I am, why don't you let me unchange the problem? Check that out. I expanded the s plus one into s plus three and minus two. Now this is my cosine match with an exponential wrapper. E to the minus three t cosine one t. The one is the square root of this one. But now I have a what? A sine cosine form without an S on top. This is the sine Co transform. Now in the sine transform, the omega has to appear on the top and the omega here is one. Be careful you don't fall into that trap. Omega squared is one, which means omega is one. If this was a four, this would have to be a two, but it's not, it's a one. What I have to do is take the two outside, put a one there. Now that's minus two exponential wrapper sine t. But that's what it would have been without this exponential on the transform. So now that I've identified what it would have been ordinarily, now I need to shift and delay. By what? Two seconds. A is two. Minus A S, A is two. Here, A is minus three. That's the minus three right there. So these are two different exponential actions happening. I have one exponential before on the inside, and then I have one exponential on the outside. And so I have to shift and delay. Okay, so now let's shift and delay. I'm gonna shift and delay by A equals two seconds. And that's gonna make this horridly messy. Minus three, T minus two, cosine, T minus two, I'm gonna to have to write two small. Minus two, E to the minus three, T minus two, sine, T minus two, Stop. That's the shifting of two seconds. Now I need to delay. The delay is just a simple heavy side function on the outside that prevents this from turning on until I get to two seconds. Actually, we're nearing the top of the hour, but this is the critical thing that I wanted to show you. This is the transition from 6.3, I'm sorry, from 6.2 to 6.3. Now your homework tonight is in 6.2, but if you're peeking ahead, this game right here that I kind of playfully refer to because I have a video by this name, as juggling the constants. You guys know any version of this old joke, right? You know, what happens when clown go, clowns go bad? Well, they go for the juggler. Juggling the constants, I don't even know if I spelled that right. 
I took this simple looking thing, which is in an inappropriate form, and I had to juggle the constants. I had to put a three here instead of a one, but then it means I had to subtract two, but subtracting two wasn't what I wanted to do because I wanted a one on top, so I had to pull the two out. This rearranging of a transform by juggling the constants. That's the critical skill I need to code and decode general Laplace transforms. Now, I'm just trying to think about this, if I could squeeze one more example in here. It never hurts to have one more example, but I don't want to be too pushy. You have what you need to do 6-2. On the other hand, 6-2, I gave you a function that you saw earlier, and I'm making you write it with a heavy side function to see if you get the same examples you did earlier. Remember you did an Euler's method problem where I gave you a funny bent driving function? On your homework tonight, I repeat the funny bent driving function that previously you could only numerically approximate, but now you can do it exactly with Laplace transform, if you can describe it. So I'm trying to decide but there is a very simple problem I could give you just to sign off today. Good, bad. I don't know. I don't want to press it. I will save it till next time because Solving differential equations, that's the fun thing we're doing. But what you really need to practice in these two sections, what you really need to get good at, is this coding and encoding. Sorry, coding and decoding, encoding and decoding. You took the differential equation and you coded it as a little pause transform. And then you had to decode it to get your answer. So you need to practice problems like this where you're coding and decoding. <coughs> and so on my website, I did prepare a worksheet where you just do a handful of goofy transforms, coding them on one side of the paper, decoding them on the other. I think you should look at that just to make sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Let's pop over to there. It was under, we're in week six, uh, not videos, plenty of videos, watch all the videos, of course. But this Laplace transform practice makes you practice coding and decoding transforms. And then, because you know, I don't wanna hide answers from you, I've worked it out again with the worked out solutions. So definitely look at this handout, Laplace transform practice, Laplace transform solutions under the handouts. Definitely look now what can we do? Juggling constants, partial fraction decomposition, shift and delay, heavy side theorem. You can almost see all of these videos. I think the only video that you're not ready for, because I haven't told you what the drag function was, is this last one. You can watch all of these. Okay, you get to it. You do a homework problem. Uh, Hand it in Tuesday, preparing for the test on Thursday. Uh, you guys are in good shape to finish this off, but this juggling of constant skill that I did right here is really important. Even the three there I juggled in that minus three over three S plus two. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the recording. I'll hang out for a second if you wanna hang out or ask a question.